Now is the time to take out the Living Faith Notes, uh, the full page insert in your worship bulletin. As you're doing so, I want to welcome those who may be listening via podcast or listening or watching online at living-faith.church. So our text is 1 John chapter 3, beginning with verse 8b and working our way through verse 18. Listen now to the word of God. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal, res eternal life residing in them. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words, but words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Uh, this is the word of God. So we're at the end of a sermon series, a, a pretty short sermon series. Of, it was supposed to be four weeks. Uh, the, the first week was, uh, where does love come from? And, and the answer is from God. We love because he first loved us. And, and think of a fountain, those fountains that have different tiers on them. Right? The water starts in the center and then flows to the second tier and then flows down. Where, where God's love flows into our hearts and we are to let that love flow out to others as well. So the, the source of our love comes from God. Week two, who are we to love? And, and, and Jesus tells us, well, we love our neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself, but Jesus also said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. We are to love all people. And we are, again, reflecting God's love as God's children. Now, week three was last week. That was the him and her concert. So we didn't have that message. I didn't, uh, I didn't preach last week. But today we're wrapping it up. And, and week four is, what does love look like? What does love look like? And, and the answer is, it, it is to look like a sacrifice. So, so our focus today is sacrificial love. Now, our text takes place in 1 John. This is the same disciple of John that was part of seeing the Mount of Transfiguration. He probably was a teenager in Jesus' lifetime. He is the author in, by, with the Holy Spirit of, of the Gospel of John, but he also wrote three epistles, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And so our text is in 1st John uh, chapter 3. And John was inspired to write these epistles towards the end of his life. And he, he lived to be quite old. He also wrote Revelation, by the way. And John's point in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John is that we are the children of God. And, and we are to reflect that, empowered by God, uh, in, in our lives. Now, biological children quite often resemble their parents. Heidi and I have three adult children, and, and, and you don't know them that well, but we see a lot of ourselves in our, in our children. Expressions, mannerisms. My youngest son, Adam, is a spitting image of me. And you can't help but, but see that. Now, as children of God, we weren't naturally born children of God. Only Jesus is the naturally born child of God. Yet, we are God's children. And we're going to receive full rights as sons. The reason of, uh, for this is adoption. God has adopted us into his family. Uh, he's made us his own. 
and he's giving us full rights as sons. Now, you might think in adoption, the adopted child would not have a resemblance biologically with the parent, right? That just, just makes sense. But spiritually speaking, God has changed us, and, and, and we are to have a resemblance of him in, in the world in which we live. Now, verse 9. I want to back up to verse 9. It says this. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. God's seed. God's seed is in us, and it has changed us. Um, there is to be a resemblance in our everyday life because we are God's children. Now, what is that seed? Peter talks about this just briefly. In um, 1 Peter 1, 23 through 25, Peter talks about being born again, just like John does. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like uh, grass, all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. It's God's word. God's word is a seed that's been planted in us. And, and through that word of God, through the Holy Spirit, uh, we are to resemble our heavenly father. And that's really 1 John, that we are to resemble him in our walk, chapters 1 and 2. By the way, my, my son Adam, we have the same walk, right? And we as adopted children are to have the same walk in our Christian life as our Heavenly Father. Uh, we are to resemble him in our love for each other. That's chapters 3 and 4. And finally, chapter 5, we are to resemble him in our lives, so we are in 1 John uh, chapter 3, and we are to resemble our Heavenly Father in our love for each other. And what does that love look like? Now, how many here are familiar with John 3.16? Raise your hand. Right, we all are. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I want you to be as, as familiar with 1 John 3.16. It says this. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. It's a powerful verse. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. What do we call that? Somebody lays down their life for you, and he died to sacrifice. He gave it up for all, he, everything. I'm glad that, that Jesus didn't say, um, I, will, I will shed 10% of my blood for you. 100%. Uh, he did not leave the cross alive. He gave the ultimate sacrifice. He sacrificed himself, his precious life, for yours and mine, in order that we might be forgiven, redeemed, in order to exchange our sins for his glory. And that's true love. True love is sacrificial. Now, now, the Greek word for love here is agape, and we are familiar now with that term. There are different Greek words that are translated love. This is agape. It's the, it's the highest type of love. It's love in action. It's love that's unconditional, and it's the love that God has for you and me. And as his children, we are to resemble God in our love now uh, for each other. So love is to be sacrificial. Now, here's an online definition of sacrifice. Sacrifice is a loss or something you give up, usually for the sake of a better cause. Sacrifice is a loss or something you give up, usually for the sake of a better cause. Face it, my, my friends, God's sacrificial love for us has changed us. That's how we can be adopted into God's family. He, he provided the redemption. He provided the sacrifice. He provided the, what's necessary for eternal life. Sins paid for in full. And then exchange again for our sins. He gives us his righteousness 
as a, as a free gift. Now that love that God has for us, which is unconditional and sacrificial, again, empowered by him, we are to resemble him and, and have a love like that, a sacrificial love for each other. Now the series is called Running on Empty, and, and some say, well, this is the problem. Uh, I have sacrificed for my employer. I have sacrificed for my family. I've sacrificed for my church. I've sacrificed for my marriage, for my spouse, and I'm spent. I have nothing left to give. And some people see that they're depleted because that's all they do is give, 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 and they're getting nothing in return. And some people conclude sacrificial love just doesn't work. Ever been there? Now, for those that think that sacrificial love simply doesn't work or may not truly exist, I want to give you a practical example of sacrificial love. And we're going to learn from some grade schoolers um, in this very uh, short video clip. shaving their heads for uh, donations. So people for the last month have been online making donations. The kids have been out getting cash donations. And as of right now, we have about 25 and adding uh, shavees. The principal of our school, Mr. Renforce, is going to be shaving his head as well. He's raising money in honor of his uh, niece who was recently diagnosed. Uh, my son Nathan and my family have been a part of this program. We're raising money in memory of my nephew Brent, Migliaccio. And um, all the kids here have just made huge uh, donations. We raised over $12,000, and money is still coming in as we speak. So I think uh, by the end of this, you will all be pretty surprised at how much money they've actually raised. And St. Baldrick, I didn't know St. Baldrick existed. But there's an example. It's a practical example. It's not a biblical example, but that's a sacrifice, isn't it? Losing your hair for a greater cause. Now, several years ago, there was a girl in Colorado, uh, her, her name, Marley Park, third grader, had cancer, under chemotherapy, lost all her hair, and she didn't want to go back to school because she didn't have any hair. And so a friend of hers, uh, Cameron McLaughlin, a little girl, same age, she said, well, tell you what, I'm going to cut my hair off too, because I don't want you to be the only one that doesn't have hair. And if you have saw the story a few years ago, it was on the news. She did that, her friend did that, and then the entire school did that. Eighty students all cut their hair for the sake of their friend so that she wouldn't feel bad that she didn't have any hair. Now again, we're adults, right? But we can learn from children. That's a sacrifice of love, giving something up for the sake of somebody else. Now let's apply that to a much deeper level and, and look at a, the sacrificial love that God's called us to have in our Christian faith. Verses 11 and 12. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Don't be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Um, so... John talks about sacrificial love. Again, we are to lay down our life for our brothers and sisters. And then he says, but don't be like Cain. Don't be like Cain. So let's, let's uh, look at this uh, portion of scripture. It's in Genesis chapter 4. If we are not to be like Cain, we better know what that's all about. So Genesis 4. So Adam and Eve have two sons, Cain and Abel. We're told this. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said... With the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of the flocks. The Lord looked on favor on Abel and his offering. 
But on Cain, his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face downcast. So two brothers, they both bring a sacrifice. One is accepted by God, Abel's sacrifice. The other one is not accepted by God. And then what's the difference? Why was one accepted by God, the other one not accepted? Um, Cain offers the fruit of the field, like fruits and vegetables to the Lord. And by the way, there are sacrifices, all kinds of types of sacrifices in the Old Testament. Animals, food, you're giving it up, uh, again, uh, it, to the glory of God. Was it that God doesn't like fruits and vegetables, but he likes steak, that he accepts the meat? Um, that's not the point, because in the Old Testament, God does accept fruits and vegetables. That was, that was part of the sacrificial system as well. It wasn't because of what he did. It was the attitude behind what he did. Uh, he offered a sacrifice, but it was not a sacri uh, sacrifice uh, of love. Uh, we go on and read. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. And it's very descriptive. Um, God cares for both Cain and Abel. Uh, and by the way, our Sunday school students, uh, you're familiar with the story. It was last week's Sunday school lesson. But think of going, opening a door, and you, you open the door and you don't see anybody, and you walk into a room, but there's somebody crouching behind the door you're very vulnerable, and they, they attack you. That's what sin does. Sin is crouching at the door, and even a good thing, like offering a sacrifice, sin wants to tackle us and bring us down in that. And that was Cain's problem. His, his attitude was gripped with sin. And when he gave the sacrifice, he was expecting something from it, expecting um, a, a reward from it. And, and God says, don't let sin do this. You must, you must master it. Does he? Verse 8. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out into the field. And while they're in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. He doesn't. He lets sin grip his heart. And even though it looked good, the attitude wasn't there. And the attitude was one of, of, of evil. And it shows itself in that he, he kills his brother. Now, the attitude that we are to have when making a sacrifice and loving each other, being willing to lay down our lives for each other, um, is not expecting anything in return. See, Cain, the context is, Cain wanted a reward. Cain wanted glory. Uh, I'll do this, God, if, if you give me glory. God doesn't do that because that's the wrong attitude. Instead, he does reward his brother Abel because Abel gave it freely not expecting anything in return. And his sacrifice was accepted, but, but Cain's was not. And this leads us to the next fill-in. True sacrificial love is love that gives without, without expecting anything in return. True sacrificial love is love that gives without expecting anything in return. Remember the law of reciprocity? We talked about that. The law of reciprocity, reciprocity is I'll give you something because more than likely you're going to give something back to me of greater or equal value. And, and Jesus said, don't do that. You, you love your friends and they'll probably re, uh, reward you. But love your enemy from whom you probably won't receive any reward. Right? The law of reciprocity. If we are doing something and we're, we're saying it's sacrificial, but we're expecting something in return. It's not sacrificial. That is not sacrificial love. What, what Cain did, it happens. It happens in churches. Having the wrong attitude when we give an offering to the Lord. Again, expecting that there, be, there will be glory and, and honor. It can happen in a marriage, right? A, a, a husband uh, doing the honey-do list, right? Getting all those things marked off knowing very well that he plans on getting up early the next morning to golf, but he hasn't told his wife that. Hoping that he'll do enough, right, to appease her so that it's okay um, to do that. 
it can happen in a church, it can happen in a marriage, it, it can happen um, in any situation. The wrong attitude for something that looks like a sacrifice to somebody else or to the Lord. Now, I want to express the next point as far as sacrificial love. I'm going to use another illustration. It's very similar to the, to, to, to the one I showed you. And here's a little bit of background from it. This has happened, by the way, last month. An elementary school teacher, 26 years old, a, a very low salary for a teacher. And his Nike shoes, which cost him $125, were stolen. And his class, the students of his class, they decide to express sacrificial love and gather money and buy him a new pair of shoes. Here's what it looks like. A grown man crying, right? Sacrificial love. Um, now I want to change this scenario a little bit. Now this didn't happen this way, but just to make a point. What if that teacher, what if he said, my $125 Nike shoes were stolen? And I expect you, each of you, to pitch in $10. And you're going to buy me some replacement shoes. And, and, and if you do this, um, I'll open up the shoes, and, and you can record it, and, and you can submit it to TikTok, and you'll get a million views, right? So um, do this. I, I demand that you give money so I can replace my shoes, and, and then uh, you'll get famous because your, your little video will go on TikTok. Uh, would that be right? Of course not, right? Um, and, and the point is this. Sacrificial love is not something that you can demand. You cannot demand it from others. It's only something you can offer to others. So sacrificial love is too much to ask, but not too much to offer. It's too much to ask. A, a wife cannot demand of her husband, you must love me. And that would truly be sacrificial love. Or uh, likewise, a husband can't say, you must respect me, demand it and it be sacrificial love. That's not how it works. Sacrificial love is too much to ask, but not too much to offer. Verses 13 through 18, just continuing on in our text. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in them. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, him, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And, and it... John makes a very strong point. Hatred is murder. Hatred is murder in the heart and is the opposite of sacrificial love. Think about that. Ever hated anybody? Been so angry, upset with them that it's hatred in your heart? I have. How does God look at that? Murder in the heart. God's law just pierces us when we realize that 
Um, sacrificial love is the opposite of hatred, and uh, hatred is murder in the heart according to our God. And then John gets very, very practical. In, in John's day, this is, this is towards the end of his life, persecutions had begun. Simply for being a professing believer in Jesus Christ, Jews and Gentiles were starting to lose their job. Um, bosses that firing them, becoming unemployed. And, and people that had plenty now living in want. And, and, and John says, if you see a brother or sister and they are in want, and you have material possessions and you don't share with them, how can the love of God be in you? It's a call to action, right? Sacrificial love is one that doesn't just talk about it, but actually shows it. And that's our, our final point this morning. Sacrificial love shows itself in action and in truth. Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. You know, it all goes back to Jesus Christ. Jesus has perfect love. Jesus shows sacrificial love. Romans chapter 5, while we were still his enemies, Christ died for us. Christ died for the ungodly, and the ungodly, that was us. When we didn't offer him back anything, he wasn't expecting it, but he freely did it when he hung on the cross. My friends, our lives have been changed by the grace and mercy of God. Uh, you don't just have a sin nature governing you. God has given you a new heart in Christ Jesus. God has planted his seed inside of your heart. And empowered by God, we are to put that into action, to reflect again that we have a heavenly father and that we are the brothers and sisters of Christ. Where you and I have failed, just take it to the Lord. There is forgiveness for hatred in the heart. Where we have, have used the wrong motive, I want something back, therefore I will do this, and it will come across like, a, like I'm making a sacrifice. God forgives you for that as well. But in part by God, let's put true sacrificial love into practice and be willing to lay down our lives for each other and, and truly show sacrificial love. Now, the definition, again, of sacrifice from online, sacrifice is a loss or something you give up, usually for the sake of a better cause. That's true. However, one final truth is this, Proverbs 22, verse 9, the generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. A blessing is a gain, is it not? God blesses us. He gives us. It doesn't make sense that we can be generous and give sacrificially, not expecting anything in return. Yet God says, as it turns out, it is a gain. That's not our motive. Don't let that be your motive. But it is absolute truth that, that God blesses those who are generous. There's no greater generosity, no greater generous being than God himself. Again, he is very generous. He has called us and changed us to be like him. You are loved by God. You're adopted in his family. Um, let's not run on empty. Let's be filled up by God and empowered by him, show a true sacrificial love for God and for each other. Amen. And now may the true peace of God, which surpasses our understanding, may it keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.